I don't want to rehash anything, but I'm just a real, uh, I'm glad to be a part of this movement with Revolution Church and uh, on this weird side of town. And man, just all of you that have invested in it in every way. Just, you know, you, you don't just attend, but you say, man, that's a part of my life. That's where I want to be. And so I, I really appreciate that. And we're seeing the fruits of that. So what a wonderful church plant. I got interviewed this past week uh, on Thursday. Uh, uh, there's a group of people that meet down in Georgia, and they're really interested in what we're doing. And they contacted me to ask me a lot of questions about how, why our church is, is thriving. What, you know, most places have about 30 or 40 people, you know, five years in. What's the difference here? And I just bragged on you and what God's doing through you and just, just your unselfishness, okay? So we might see that in the fall. There's a print out there. I'll make that available to you uh, if it pops up in the fall. So I'm just really excited. I want you to know about that. Now, I want you to really tune in today. Uh, we're talking about momentum. That's the name of our uh, sermon series. It's just, man, I see people. I've been in ministry a good, a good while now, probably since about... Uh, probably around 2001 or two, just uh, maybe just volunteering. And then I, I started student ministry in 2003. And then we planted this church in late 2011. And so I've watched people listen, come and go. I've seen people, man, they're, they're hitting home runs and even grand slams for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? They're really getting it done. And you see this passion and this fire in them. And then what you do is you see them, they lose it. Just something fizzles, right? It's not even, even necessarily something, one thing that happens that knocks them out. That happens. But what, what we see is people just fizzle out of their passion for serving the Lord. And man, I really want to give us some help because here's what I know. It's not what I think or feel. I know that God has positioned us. He's given her, us a bigger stage and access to more people in the future. And what we've been doing as a church is just... Uh, focusing in, uh, just uh, laser focused in on, on us. You know, what, what do we got to do for ourselves? We, we do for the community, man, and we attract them and tell them about the love of Jesus. Man, follow Jesus and this life that he's created us for. But along the way, we have to work on, uh, Scripture tells us it, that we, we have to be focused in on what, what's going on around us. That's in our relationships. So we did a series just on relationships, marriage, dating, sex, right? Yeah. And so then we talked about parenting, man. We just, and then we talked about how do we, God's going to give us access to people. How do we deal with that? What kind of church are we? What kind of church are we? Who, who, who gets to come inside this church, right? And so we made that clear. Hopefully it ran the people off that, didn't, that, that just doesn't agree with that that, we, that, that the gospel should be open to everybody, even the least likely. So God's doing something in us, and he's molding us. If you can just kind of look back at our timeline recently, God's hard at work. And, and what I'm thankful for is that you've made yourself accessible to that, that you see God putting a puzzle together in your life and the life of our church. But here's something that stares us in the face. If we're going to get this stage that God's going to give us, and access to these people and big things where we're going to feel like we're over our head, but we know that God has positioned us for us, there's an issue of momentum in our spiritual life, right? Some of you, maybe it's, you, you've been a part of a, a church body or your walk with Christ was super boring in that you could just observe. I'm not sure how much of a, a following Jesus that really is, but maybe it was even reinforced okay? You were never challenged to move forward in your faith and, and be on guard for the things that will take you out. And like I said, it's not usually things that, that are just horrible things. It's just a loss of momentum. Something happened, and you just maybe didn't know what to do. Now, some of y'all are you're on fire right now. I can't stop you. You know, if I threw water on you, it wouldn't put the fire out, right? And then I know in this crowd, there, there's probably many of us that maybe are going, you're in a funk, in a situation where I want to please God, maybe you even have done that before. You've, you remember what that's like, and that makes it even worse. Because I want to get back to that. How do, I, how do I get back to that place? Right? And some of you are like, man, I just, I, I've got momentum now. I want to keep it. I want to keep it. I don't want that to leave me again because that's a place where I get depressed. I get lonely. I start chasing the wind. I start living a life that's frustrating and mediocre at best. Okay, so this thing that we're talking about, this momentum, I picked out some scripture for today. I think if you zero in, it'll really help you. It'll help you guard what you've got, or maybe it'll reposition you to get that momentum again that you had before. 
Because look, I know that our best days are ahead as a church and your best days are ahead of you individually, right? And so I'm, I'm going from that angle. And so I'm going to just read scripture. I'm going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19. You're not going to hurt my feelings if you pull it up on your phone. I'm just going to assume you're looking at scripture. You version is awesome. All right. And sometimes you just got to get that old Bible out, crack it open and read it. But if that's, it's too dark in here, it's what you, just, you didn't bring it today, it'll be on the screen. All right. So that's where we're going to be. And we're going to kind of, not going to jump around a whole lot, but I'm going to skip a few verses just for the sake of time. And so what we're going to do is look at this guy in Scripture in the Old Testament who I think this, this what we get to look in and see today is, is just an awesome account of somebody that just lost their momentum. Somebody that God was working fiercely through and then extremely quickly he lost his momentum. Okay? And we see just how low he goes. We see how low he goes. Now, uh, we're going to look at this guy. It's going to be in... Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to go through chapter 9. And then I'm going to skip down to 14 and go through 16. So that'll be what it looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and just start reading. This is what the Bible says. Now, this is, it's a lot of reading and some funny names. And I'm going to try to enunciate and illustrate all I can. But it's important that you know the flow of this, okay? So here we go. Now, Ahab told Jezebel. Jezebel was this queen, a mean queen, Okay everything Elijah had done. I'll tell you about it in a minute. And how he killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, what she's saying is, I swear to God. You ever heard somebody say that? I swear to God. By God, this is going to happen. And may the gods deal with me if it doesn't by tomorrow. Not our God, not the God of the Bible, but these false gods that she had. She says, I'm telling you, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like that of one of them. What she's saying is, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him for what he's done. The Bible goes on to say, Elijah was afraid. He was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. He's got a servant, an assistant. Somebody that's with him through thick and thin. He left his servant there while him while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Now, I think of woods and mountains, wilderness. Of course, we're talking over the Middle East, so we're talking, about, we're talking about desert, okay? So don't get that confused. He came to a broom bush, a broom bush. I'll come back to that. Sat down under it and prayed that he might die. Things are getting pretty low for Elijah, okay? He's got somebody coming after him, and he's under a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. He says this, I have had enough, Lord. You ever been there? This life just becomes overwhelming. Something happens and you're just ready to throw in a towel. He says, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around. And there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, he ate, and he drank. So he was strengthened by that food and traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And what we'll find out later is this is actually Mount Sinai. Some of y'all kind of read the Bible a little bit. For those, those people that are, you know, kind of familiar with it. Those that aren't, a lot of stuff happened at this mountain. It was called Mount Sinai, okay? It means a lot of, God did a lot of things there. And so, so he, was, he was traveling there. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? So I'm going to skip to 14. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put, up, and, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from, from Abel-Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Although I can't pronounce those well, 
They're very important later. Okay? Okay? So here we go. I just read a whole lot of stuff. Weird names. But God's going to pull out a lot of things in there. Man, we can learn from Elijah. I think it's what he's, he, God wants to put into us today. So let's pray. God, we've got our heads bowed, and we just want to uh, invite you in here today, Lord. We've, we've invited you with our, our, uh, our praise, Lord, our worship of you, God. We, we, we've worshiped you in our giving, God. And God, so many people are, have stepped up to say, I want to be used by you, God. And, and God, I thank you that you, uh, I, I beg that you would uh, just continue to pour into our lives, Lord. And we know that we see you moving. Uh, in this community, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that, that you allow us to be a part of that. So we just ask your word just to pierce us, God, and open up areas of our life, Lord, that need the attention, Lord. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. So Elijah here is in, 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 in what you got to know, a little bit of background. We're in chapter 19. In, ch in chapter 18, there was a lot going on. It'd be cool to go back and read that. And what's going on there is you'll, you'll, you'll hear and see in Scripture how Elijah prayed that God would send fire from heaven, and he did. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. It's awesome to read. And he also prayed that there would not be rain, and then he prayed that there would be rain, and God sent it. So when Elijah prays, man, something happens. There's, he's been in the middle of miracles from God. Elijah has just seen in the chapter before God move in so many ways, and now we're in here in uh, chapter 19, and Elijah finds out that this Queen Jezebel is coming after him. There's some stress in his life now. There's a, 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 something overwhelming that, that's been introduced to his life. Maybe you can relate. And things just kind of came to shut down. And, and, and she's really T.O.'d or P.O.'d, whatever it is, the initials are. She's mad and upset. Uh, and she wants him dead. And so we're going to watch his reaction because in chapter 18, he's a man of God doing it. He's feeling it and being a part of God's movement. And then in 19, something happens and he gets totally shut down. And it sounds like two different people. When you look at 18 and 19, two different people. If you're anything like me, sometimes I feel that way, right? Sometimes I feel like, man, I'm really getting it done for the Lord. I really enjoy this. I see God moving and he allows me to be a part of this. And sometimes I feel so far from what God's doing. I've lost all momentum. I've lost everything, and I don't know how to get it back. How did I ever get there? And so I want to talk about how you get there. It's going to sound a little smart, Elliot, but I'm really giving direction on how do we lose that momentum, first of all. How, do, how can we become aware so that we don't lose momentum? But I don't want to stop there. I want to look at how, do we, how does Scripture show us that we get it back? What does God do through us and for us and in us that makes it where we can feel him again? It's not a numb. We're not just showing up to church because that doesn't last long. That's why you see people trickle in and out of churches, right? It's because they lost that momentum and don't know how to get it back. God loves us. He loves us. And he wants to give us something today so that we can guard against that, all right? So in his case, he's got a queen that's coming after him and wants to kill him, all right? That's his thing. That's his thing that's threatening his momentum. And some of y'all, we could sit here all day and just exchange stories on what's threatening our momentum, right? Man, some of you are married, but you couldn't tell it, right? Maybe it looks good here, but when you get home, it's another story. You'd be embarrassed, right? Maybe it's your job. Maybe you're so sick of your job. Maybe it's so hard on you physically or emotionally that sometimes you just want to quit or quit church one, right? Something's got to give, right? So that's what we're looking at here. And so I think hopefully some of you are already um, relating because sometimes you can feel like, man, when I, when I hit that lack of momentum and feeling numb and like I can't do for God again and, and get that back, I must not be a very spiritual person. I must not have been spiritual to begin with. But I think what Scripture's dying to tell us here, it's really wanting to put on a lap, is listen, this is one of the most faithful men of God that ever lived. So many miracles came out of this guy, so many, and he's in that place. He's in a dark, lonely, numb feeling, far from God place. And so we want to, we got to look at how he got there, okay, because it threatens us too. So I'm going to take a few minutes and run through that. Are y'all still with me? I need your amen. Yeah, oh, y'all getting crazy. That's pretty good. So it's going to be kind of a how-to type of sense. How did he get that way? 
And the first one is this. I'm going to give you three steps to, to how you lose your momentum. How do you get numb? How do you start to get kind of impotent in your faith? And the first one is this. Uh, I'm going to, if you'll put it on here, because I might lose this here in a minute. The first one is this. Is three ways to lose momentum. Number one is we forget about God and what he's done for me. We forget about God. That's, that's how you do it. You start to forget. I'll just have to go from memory in here in a minute. That'll be good, though, won't it? Because here's what happens. We get spiritual amnesia. Here's what happens. We see God. We've seen God move in other people and in our lives. And even if you, you're brand new to this thing, and maybe if you, have, you haven't even started believing yet, you see God moving in other people, or you probably wouldn't be here. And so many times when we hit that place in life where those things happen, your thing, my thing, happens, and they never stop happening. We become so hyper-focused, right? We become hyper-focused on the bad thing, that one report when the doctor shows up and gives you some bad news. When your boss closes the door behind him and comes in and tells you, you know, you know I've got to talk about your job here, right? Things just kind of fall to pieces. And so what we do is we just forget. We just, we, we, God wants us to, and he talks about it several times in Scripture, just what that looks like. Remember me. They used to set up uh, uh, little things of rocks and, and things to, to, so that they would never forget. They'd win a battle. They would set up a pile, pile go, get a, go get a rocks and pile them up. So every time we pass here or anybody else, some, somebody else passes here, they'll see that and they will remember that God gave us victory. Okay? Because we forget. We forget that and we become focused on all the bad things. So number one, if you... You want to really lose your momentum. Forget what God's done for you in the past. But, I wrote this thing. Yeah, I think it'll pop up. It's hard to forget things that God has done when you're always celebrating it. Okay? I'll say that again. It should pop up on your screen. It's hard to forget what God has done when you're always celebrating it. There's something about the habit of gratitude that we have to, if we're going to guard our momentum, right, and we're going to keep it moving forward, one of, the, one of the, the tips and one of the tricks and one of the things that help you hold on to that is the fact that, man, I'm, 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 I'm so thankful. Let me stop just a minute and count all the things that I'm thankful for, what God is doing in my life. Thank you for that breath of air, God. Thank you for that one. Thank you for that one, right? That we just get in a habit. You know those people? I love them. And I forget how much I'm not gr full of gratitude when I run into these people. They're just thankful for everything. God, thank you for that pimple on my face. Right, teenagers? You know what I'm saying? God, thank you. And I, they don't get on my nerves. They just remind me of, man, when they get in a low place, they're going to remember what God has done for them. Okay? So don't get out of the habit of your gratitude. Because when you do, you start to lose your momentum. All right? Here's the other thing. Here's the second thing. Um, is that we fear what others think about me. We can lose that so quickly when we start dwelling on what other people think about us. And most of the time, y'all notice this, it's people that we don't even know or maybe even don't even like. Don't we worry about that too much? And here's somebody in, in his life, it's the queen. She can't stand him, she hates him, and she's taking him out. And if we're not careful, if we don't monitor that, that what we think of people, and it's in our face, isn't it, with social media. I love Facebook and, and Twitter. I don't love Pinterest because I'm a man. I'm a man's man. But I, I, Instagram, I love those things. But if you're not careful, you'll become obsessed of what other people think. What do they think of me? Did they like this? Did they like that? How many likes do I have, right? So we've got to watch out. It's in our face. And there's a real tendency for us to do that. And I just don't understand why we do that. And here's something that might help you through the week. Just a, a little quote is this. is Fear of men will always keep you from being who God has called you to be. That's what takes people out the fastest. It takes me out on occasion. God's called me to do this big, bold thing that, that nobody I know has ever done before. But what are these other people going to think about me? And not even you all. I think you're with me. But is that too bold? Does is that, is that, is that draw too much attention to us? Right? 
And as, as a, I slow down my church, I slow down my family, I slow down my, my walk with Christ when I become obsessed with what other people think. It attacks your momentum. Okay? Listen, even in this context, listen, Richard, I, I, I see that what, what Jesus does when I read Scripture, when I hear it, that he goes to the least likely of people and he heals them. I, and I feel like that's me. Jesus has got a hold of me. He's got a hold of my life. But I'm so worried about if people remember or find out about my past. That happens so often. I think some of you are, are a half a step away from doing something, having God unleash something amazing in your life. But you are concerned too much with what people think about your past. Are they going to bring that up? Right when I'm in the middle of it, I'm doing something awesome for God and somebody's going to pop up and say, yeah, but I know who they used to be and who they probably are now. And it paralyzes us. And that's why we can't move forward. Our family can't move forward. It's because we're so concerned about that. There's a guy here that works with the, maybe he's in here, probably not. And uh, he's about a year or two older than me. And I saw him. He was working with campers. And I know a lot of the people that work at the Y. And, she, and they said, hey, Richard, hey. You know, people around here know me because I'm here. And this guy said, hey, man, I like him. I like the guy. And he said, I remember him. He used to stay in trouble. I thought, hmm, he's right. And I did. I stayed in trouble. All right. But I, when we first started, I used to worry so much that somebody would just pop up and point and say something I'd done or said. Right. And it is. It can be paralyzing. But God makes us brand new. When Jesus intervenes into our life he makes us new and gives us a new identity and listen we've got to be more concerned with what God says about us than what men do right so if you want to lose your momentum or if you're trying to get it back stop worrying about what people think and what they say when you're obedient when you move into what God's called you to do I can't it's hard to find people in scripture that were already prepared for what God had for them so it's a good place to start so if you if you feel like I'm not equipped to move forward. Somebody's going to think I'm not good enough or know enough about the Bible. They're going to, they're going to uh, suspect it and probably be right. Uh, you're in good company. We're all in over our heads, okay? So that's what we want to do. So he had forgotten about what God had done. And he had feared. He had feared what people were saying, all right? Now, here's a third one. I think we do this all the time. Sometimes we don't realize it as much. The third one is this, is that we flee from those close to me. Not this kind of flee. We run from people that are close to us. Sometimes we separate ourselves and we lose our momentum. Because listen, God is busy, extremely busy trying to put people around you. We've spent sermon series on this. Remember circles? Part of what God's going to do in your life and what you're going to do for the kingdom involves other people that he's going to place into your life. And so sometimes when we start to lose our momentum, we don't feel as spiritual, and uh, we get a little distracted, and we just kind of start taking steps away. When God's given you, I think, an awesome church, we're not, certainly not the best, but it's pretty awesome. I think it's full of great people that are trying. They're not perfect. They're imperfect. But they're trying really hard, and they understand enough Scripture to know that even though I'm messed up, and even though our church and our people isn't perfect, God has put us together so we can go through life together. And so what happens is, here's where we lose our momentum. We start moving away from church. We start moving away from the Bible. You know what I'm saying? We start moving away from life groups. We take those steps away. And that's when you see people losing momentum. They start dropping like flies. Right? So those are three things that's going on. I want to talk about that just a little bit more. Elijah ran. He was scared. He became really scared and afraid. His circumstances happened. Right? And I remember being afraid, and I started thinking about all the times I've been afraid, and y'all would, y'all would laugh or get mad or whatever at all the trouble I've been into and all the times I've had to run. All right? I can run faster than anybody in this room. If somebody's chasing me, you know what I'm saying? Now, if we're just out here, let's race. I'm like, ah, I don't even do that anymore. The only time I run is somebody's chasing me, and they're going to hurt me and kill me. And I, I got you. I, what I do is I, I start running with my fist like this, and when my thumbs go up, it's like hitting turbo. It's okay. So if we get some 
uh, redneck dude, sorry, rednecks, uh, with a machete. Hey, you won't see me, right? So I started thinking about, man, one time in particular, my uncle lives in Bessemer City and his wife, and it's, I've told you about it before, past the cemetery, uh, Edgewood Cemetery, going down. See the left, there's a lake back there. It's hidden. Let's go back there and skip rocks, and I can make it skip like 10 times, no joke. And you can fish back there or whatever you want to do. And so I stay just a little bit too late, just a little bit too long. You know what I'm saying? It starts getting dusky dark. And so I try to keep it cool. I'm like, oh. So I try to strut home. And so I'm walking home. It's kind of a long walk or a short run. And so, you know that, you know, when you're a kid and you hear something, you're like, that's all it took. And so I'd run back as fast as I can, you know, just, it's like a cartoon dust coming out from behind me. And I'm, I truck it all the way home. And I, when I get in the house, you know, everybody's sitting there, you know, maybe cooking out or something like that. And I'm going, you know, when you're trying to, when you're breathing hard, but then you're trying not to, right? I was doing that. I said, what, what's wrong? Is something wrong? Are you scared? I'm like, no, nah, man. No, nah, I just really like this all the time. But I'm scared. And I'm running. Okay? When we, when we get scared, we run. When things start to fall apart, we have this built-in tendency to move away. And in our spiritual life, that is dangerous. We lose momentum when we walk away. Look at this. Elijah was afraid and he ran and he's got this servant with him that has been through him. And when you read in chapter 18, his servant's been with him through all kind of awesome things that he saw God do with him. So if I'm a servant, I'm looking at Elijah I'm like, man, I'm sticking with him because God really does stuff through him, right? It's scary a lot, but God seems to come through. And this particular servant was even participated in some of these things like, hey man, I really pray for God to send some rain. I know it hasn't rained in three years, but I prayed to God would send rain. Go check that cloud. Or there's a little story in there. It's a little cloud. It says it's about the size of a hand. And uh, so he's the one that kept going back and forth, this servant, to check. No, it doesn't look like any rain. Come back and kept doing it. So he's with him, right? This servant is with Elijah. He's his teammate in this, right? He's through thick and thin, right, bro? And the Bible says that he ran. He ran. Now, he ran too. Because he's probably thinking, dude, if he's freaking out, I better freak out. Right? So this, this servant, his servant is with him. And he went all the way up to a place called Beersheba. And, he, and here's what Elijah says. Elijah leaves and said, you've got to stay here. I'm going to take about a day trip into this wilderness, which is the desert. And I'm just going to go. And he'd been with him for years. And what he's doing, he's isolating himself from somebody that had his best in mind. Somebody that he kind of had a connection with God with. It's something they sat around and talked about. You can't have a servant that's with you all, with, through, through all those things and not talk about God. And he's leaving him in this moment. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, you got to be careful with that. If God's got you plugged into a church, Maybe you're just visiting today. You already go somewhere else. You're just checking it out. But look, that's a way to lose your momentum, and it's so hard to get it back. It's very difficult to get it back. So he's left him here, and we do that all the time. So Elisha does that. He, he's, he finds himself running, and he's sitting in the middle of a desert, and he's, uh, nobody's around him. He's by himself. Maybe you feel like that in your circumstances. He's under a broom bush. You know what I'm saying? If you think about a broom bush, go look it up. It's like broom bush. And back in the old days, you see people with like, it looks like a homemade, just a limb that they broke down. They don't have any leaves on them. Okay? It's just like they broke the branch and it's, it just kind of spray. Whatever you think it looks like, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Right? But there's no leaves. So he's, he's even, listen, he's so down on his luck and distant from people and everybody on the run and hiding. And even the bush he's laying under doesn't have any leaves. You see what I'm saying? He's exposed. This isn't a good situation for him, and that's what he's doing here. And here's what he's praying. He's praying at this moment. He's under this bush, and he's praying. This same guy that prayed for fire to happen, and it happened. Come out of heaven. It's the same guy that prayed for rain to happen. Rain. And now, guess what? He's praying that God would kill him. In my life, Lord. That's a dangerous thing to pray. 
Because when he prays, things happen, right? So he's in a moment. Listen, he's desperate. He feels far from God. He is far from God. He just wants to throw in the towel. He's scared and alone. He doesn't know how to get back to where he was with God, right? Y'all follow me? Good. So he's praying. He's praying, God, I want to die. And he got there in a real quick hurry, right? Because from 18 to 19, and here he is. So this can happen to you quickly. You can lose your momentum very quickly, can't you? You can be serving and going, and all of a sudden, man, I, f- I feel distant and numb, right? So, I, I, you know, I know, because I hear, I talk to you, and you talk to me. Some of you, you know, are transparent like that. I, I really appreciate that. You say, man, my marriage is like that. My job's like that. My circumstances are a lot like that. Man, I, I feel like I got to do all this hustle or I got to just leave. I can't be here. And that's where he is. I just can't do this anymore. So the Bible says that he fell asleep. So he's under this bush praying this prayer and he falls asleep. And some of y'all might say, that's exactly where I am. That's where I'm at. So what do you do? That's the first half of what we're talking about. How did he get there? Okay, how did he get there? He got so concerned with what people thought. He forgot about what God had done for him, right? And he left people that God had strategically placed around him, all right? So that's how he got there. But I wouldn't want you to leave without saying, you know, how do I get that back? What do I do from here? What does Scripture say, Rich? I really don't want to know what you think. You're going to have to point to me in Scripture. What, What does God do to move us back to that point? Because after all, Revolution Church... The whole thing we're based on is, listen, we're being a part of this movement that, hey, look, we're moving people from where they are to where God wants them to be. And in in this case, far from God, numb, numb about God, total loss of momentum. So the Bible says he fell asleep. So the rest of our time, I'm going to give you a few things, and it won't take it quite that long. A few things. How do we get that momentum back? And it's going to seem pretty simple here when I get started. Uh, Verse 5, 6, and 8 are going to pop up. And I just want you to hang with me. We're going to see what God says about how you get your momentum back. We're going to look at Elijah, and I think it applies to us today. And here's what it says. Verse 5, 6, and 8. It says, Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He ate and drank, then lay down again. So he got up and ate and drank so he's lost full momentum very impotent in his faith and the Bible says he slept and ate and slept and ate amen right right isn't that awesome and so we're going to see if you're taking notes how did he get out of this funk and here's the first thing how do you get out of that funk that numbness that lack of momentum I want to get it back first of all if you want to gain some momentum you've got to recharge your body the Lord is absolutely in a loving way kicking my tail about this so this comes from kind of inside of me too not just in scripture but uh, I've got to move forward I've got to I've got to God's moving fast we've got to keep up and sometimes we sabotage some of that progress and one of them is that we got to stop and look and recharge our body and some of y'all are probably thinking, you know, wouldn't this church, shouldn't the first thing we do is read our Bible and come to church? And pray? Yeah, yeah, you should do that. You should do that. But when, when I look at Scripture here, the first thing that God does, the first thing He does in the process is recharging Him physically. Okay? Char- recharging Him physically. And so, if you're in a place like Elijah, and He's absolutely drained. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually, right? He's been through a lot. Remember, he killed 400 of these these idol-worshiping priests, okay? So he had a, that was physically draining to him. But how many of you know, because we try to compartmentalize this. I'm guilty too. Well, that's just physically draining. But if you've ever been to war, some of y'all, maybe some veterans in here, okay? Maybe you just got in a fist fight. But it's not just a physical toll, it also affects you emotionally and spiritually. And so where God gets started in, in bringing back his momentum, God's got a whole lot more for him to do. He's not done with him. Although he felt done, 
He felt drained. He wanted to die. God said, I got so much for you to do. And here's how we're going to get you there. We're going to look at this. He's completely spent. And God says, I'm going to start with your physical renewal, right? Physical renewal. And that's how he does it, is when he starts to renew us, he does it physically. Comes up and says, look, you're thin. You look tired. Take a nap. Eat some food. Rest. Watch Netflix, right? Anyway, I'm sorry. Wrong crowd. But he's absolutely fatigued. And we live in a society that kind of promotes that, don't we? We hear somebody sleeps eight hours, like eight hours? Dang, man. You need to get up and do something, right? We kind of do that. And sometimes we even wear it like a badge. I only slept four hours and I worked 70 hours this week, you know? And what, what we don't pay attention to is actually, that's not just a bad idea. Make, makes you ineffective, probably in a lot of ways. It's also disobedience. It's also disobedience. So God wants to, he's trying to change how we think about our rest. He wants to think about our physical renewal. That's how he wants us to. And he's already laid it out for us. God says, I want you to discover this. I want you to uh, really understand how important this is of rest. Now listen, in the Bible, if you're new to Scripture, we've got, there's, there's ten commandments, and one of those is keep the Sabbath and make sure it's holy, that it's set apart, that there's, there's a specific time that you rest. Now, when Jesus came along in the New Testament, he is our true rest, okay? We don't have to worry about being accepted because he accepts us. He is our true rest, but there's still this principle of the Sabbath, and Sabbath is just a season where you don't do any work. Just, just tell me plain, Rich. Don't, don't, don't make it churchy. It's just a set-apart time where you are strategically and intentionally unplugging and shutting down so that you can rest, so that you can do more. Right? And so, even though Jesus is our, our true rest, there's still a principle of rest. Because look at what he says in, in verse 14. This might not pop up. Elijah says, when God says, hey, man, what are you doing? He says, he says, God, I've, I'm, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. What he's saying is that not jealous. Zealous. It means I've been busy, passionately busy. I've just been on the go. Real busy, Lord. What are you doing here? I'm busy. I've been so busy. And here's what I want you to kind of put in your back pocket, pull it out later this week when you try to think about, you know, what do we talk about Sunday? And this is one of them is this. Rest is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. So if you're trying to be obedient, you're trying to do what God's called you to do, and you want to, that, that obedience spill over into your, how you parent and how you work at your job and the impact you have on people and the influence you get through being obedient to God, one of those is rest. Looking for, blocking out, intentionally doing nothing. Okay? Some of you feel real guilty about that. Some of you really do. You feel, you carry a lot of guilt about any downtime you have. Don't let nobody catch me napping. Don't let them catch me doing any of that. But most of us are like, man, yeah, I got a lot to do. I'm real busy. But before God ever speaks to his heart, before God ever gives him instruction, his next instruction, before God ever moves him forward, he rests him spiritually. He said, look, you got to rest. Sleep and eat. Sleep and eat. How many of you know this? Sometimes the most holy thing you can do is take a nap. Some of y'all get Pentecostal on that, don't you? Yeah. Right? God's saying, look, you are not disappointing me. When you rest, you're being obedient. You're preparing yourself to hear from me. You're preparing yourself to move forward. And I'm going to pile it on you. But look, that's an opportunity to be disobedient in a heartbeat. As a matter of fact, it's probably the, the commandment that we ignore the most, that we are disobedient to the most, is resting. We don't give it a second thought. Because we still feel so productive sometimes, right? We feel productive in that. He's saying, look, seriously, get something to eat. Because, you know, we're, we're created in God's image. And that is to produce and work. That is a thing, right? That is something that we're called to do as humans is to work and do those things. Because we're, that's the image of God. He's busy. He's a busy God. 
but it's also the, in the image of God to rest. On the seventh day, he rests. If we're going to really be like God and, and his son Jesus, is, we've got to pick out a time to rest. It's obedience. It boils down to obedience. So, before I move to the second one, is, is this, I thought, people are probably like me. They need a stop doing list. Some of y'all need that really, really bad. That's your next step. I need a stop doing list. I need something, some stuff got to be peeled away. There's some things in my life that, that just need to go and be put on hold. Okay? So part of that, your step is maybe this week is to say, man, what does God want me to stop doing? If I really laid it out there to him and he's going to speak to me back about this issue, what are those things? What are those things? Just, and it's probably not bad things. It's probably not bad things. It's, but it's things that distract you. It's things that take away your momentum and what God's called you to do. And so I challenge you and encourage you to ask God what that is. He, 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 he's not trying to hide it from you. All right? Sometimes we try to hide it from him. So if you're going to gain some momentum, I want you to read this verse 8. Listen to this. And I'll move into number 2. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb or Mount Sinai the mountain of God there he went into a cave and spent the night and the word of the Lord came to him what are you doing here so Elijah had gone into the desert he's pouting he's ready to die take my life God and and God graciously said you need to eat you look thin Um, you need some sleep and 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 scripture goes on to say that he's been strengthening and and God says this God says okay look uh, the journey's going to continue it's time to move forward. You've been refreshed. You've, you've, you've taken rest. And now I'm ready to, to do some things to you and through you. And so he goes to this mountain that we talked about earlier, Mount Sinai. And this is where Moses was given the Ten Commandments. So this is a special place. Listen, this is important. How do I keep my momentum or how do I keep from losing it? How do I get it back? God sent him to this place. Mount Horeb or, or the, the mountain of God or Mount Sinai because some awesome things God had really moved at this mountain. Moses had gone up there and received the Ten Commandments. Time after time at this location, he, he was taking himself to a place where God was known to work through faithful people. God had shown up there before. And so that's where he's going. He goes to this place. And so this is number two. If you want to gain some momentum, you need to renew your worship. Renew your worship. There's something that you need to do. God, put this back in me, but there's, you know, do something in my heart. Uh, You can pray that, and that's awesome prayer to pray. But sometimes there's things you need to do. There's, There's things you need to, places you need to position yourself. There's some steps you need to take. Again, there's this tendency for us to pull away from people and God and church, people that God surrounds us with. But instead of running away, Elijah has done the opposite. Instead of stepping away that tendency, he fought it. He said, I'm going to go to where I've seen God work before, where he's been known to move. And maybe for us, that's church. Maybe that's being in a service just like this, where we know that God has moved. Does that make sense? We position ourselves where God's going to show up there. I want to be around. I need to be around where God is moving. I need some of that to follow me. I need to rediscover that. I need to step back in the life group. Those are some pretty nice gals and guys. Nothing, it's nothing that happened. I just kind of fell out. I need to go back. I need to surround myself with people again. And in fact, this place where you went, uh, later in the text, it talks about uh, Elijah heard a great wind. I want to kind of get into this for a minute. It's like a tornado, that kind of strong, strong wind. But he's at this cave, and the Bible just doesn't say it's a cave. A lot of scholars think it's the cave, the cave that, uh, uh, that the cliff in where that uh, Moses, uh, where God passed by and uh, his glory passed by. He was like in a crevice, okay, a cave when God passed by, all right? So he's at that cave and he hears, he hears this great wind. And then it goes on to say that he felt and heard this great earthquake. So he's feeling this. It's a lot of noise. 
imagine the noise of an earthquake or a noise of a tornado. And then, and then later it says a, a noise, a great fire, like a consuming fire. Like it's just engulfed. You ever heard fire? It can get really loud if it's big. And so scripture says that he heard the, all that noise, right? A lot of noise. But scripture also said that none of those things were God. That wasn't God doing but instead, Scripture says that, because in ancient times, I forgot to mention this, whenever you had an earthquake and fire, it symbolized God's activity. But Scripture said, not here. Not here. And what it says instead was that he wrapped himself in a cloak and went to the mouth of the cave. And, and, and that's where the Bible says that God spoke to him in a small and still voice. Okay? And I think that's interesting that about that whole noise bit and what was going on, I, I started thinking, man, if people are like me, man, it's hard to follow Jesus. It's hard to stay focused. It's hard not to lose momentum. It has to be intentional. And there's a lot of noise in life, right? We can't escape it. If I'm going something through right now, yep, you know, all that'll end one day. But then, isn't it crazy? Then there's another storm. Then there's another dramatic event. Then there's another... All of those things, they just keep coming. But God says, if you, if, if you, listen, I'm trying to teach you how to get your momentum back. And sometimes we have to, look, move away from the noise. Sometimes we have to unplug, right? Sometimes that's literally, bam, the computer, the laptop, our phones. Because God wants to speak to us in a small, still voice. And so listen, all those things that come around you, all those things, and we can, like I said, we can sit here all day and talk about what we're going through, you know, what's distracting you, what's keeping you from moving forward. I'd be a little bit more of this if, I, if this wasn't happening as much. I've got this going on right now. And what you sacrifice in that moment is hearing God speak to you. And look, I'm not judging. Man, maybe you, you need to work 120 hours a week because that's the only way you're going to get some groceries. I, I'm just telling you what scripture is pretty clear is that we can miss the voice of God with all the noise of life. And sometimes that noise isn't bad. It's not bad stuff. It's awesome stuff. But does it prevent us from hearing the voice of God? Because sometimes I mean, we've got to be intentional. We've got to get away. We've got to step back from the noise. We have to get in a place where we can hear from God that we know God speaks. And some of you might be at that point, like, you know, I've stepped away. It's been baby steps or maybe giant steps. But I'm feeling that lack of momentum. There's not much going on in and around me. And to be honest, I don't know how to get it back. God's saying we've got to unplug. We've got to be intentional about that. Here's the third thing, and I'll be done. If you want to gain some momentum, we have to refocus our life. Let me explain that. Verse 14 and 15, I won't go back and read it all. He says, God says, what are you doing here? Right? He says, I've been busy. I've done this. I've done that. I'm doing all this stuff and now I'm the only one left and they're wanting to kill me. Because when you get in that place where you're a victim and it's, or, it, or it's all about you, I love God's response to this because he didn't give him a hard time about being selfish. Doesn't all of a sudden it becomes about us. We find ourselves lacking momentum. We've got reasons, excuses. I got to do this. I got to be honest with I got to do that. And God says, you know what? I'm trying to get you back on track to what I've got planned for you. What I've got carved out for you. But God gives him a, two things. God gives him a renewed purpose. And not only that, he gives him people to do this purpose with. So he was down and out. God refreshed him. God uh, said, man, you need rest. And then he positioned himself to hear from God. And God says, now you're rested. Your, better, your best days are ahead. I got some things for you now. It's time to get back on the saddle. It's time to get back to doing what 
what I've called you to do. I want you to go here. Remember we read that? I said those names and places are important. They're hard to announce or pronounce. But they're important places and important people. And, and I want you to be a part of that. Now go. Go here. Go do that. Go anoint this person. Go anoint that person. And I want you to notice, uh, listen, this is, this is part of it. Because when you lose momentum, you can really get centristic. That means about you. And God says, listen, my solution for you, which is after the last couple of weeks, he gives you instruction, and that is part of the solution. I'm going to do something in you and through you. I, got, I still got plans for you, and they're huge. But they involve other people. Other people, not you. And so what God does to give you back momentum is, listen, what he was basically, God was basically saying was go here and go there and invest in those people. Spend your life with those people. Be a mentor to them, right? Elisha, which, which succeeded him as a prophet. Pour into him. Listen, there's something to that that you're missing out on. It might be why you're stuck and why you can't move forward. It's because God, maybe God has wants you to invest in other people. And man, we had a huge, like Brittany said, response to people moving into serving. It's something I lack. I need that in my life. There's something to it. So I want you, if you'd stand up, I got a homework assignment. This is what I want you to work on. Look, I'm a therapist, what I do outside of here, and there's most of the work that, listen, most of the progress I make with my patients, they come up in with some rough stuff, man. And I'm in there with them. But I don't get to see them again for a long time later for a short amount of time. Feels a lot like church. I'll see, for some of you, I won't see you till next week. So with my patients, what I do is I assign homework assignments. Maybe it's something to read. Maybe it's an exercise that we practice there. Okay? Some information. I want, here's what I want you to go do. This is going to improve your quality of life. It's going to move you forward. Because look, most of the work, if you're doing it right, most of their progress will happen between our sessions on things they work on at home, their homework. So I thought, you know, what can I do? I mean, they heard all this. Are they going to remember it? Did they write it down? Did they sleep? Because it's desperate in their life and they might not even know it yet. On things they need to move forward. It's urgent. So here's three things. Here's three things. Number one is practice the Sabbath. I want you to find a way when you leave here, when is that going to be? Now, I don't want you to get all legalistic about it, okay? That's not what I'm telling you to do. When, find a time. Discuss it with the people in your immediate life. This is when I'm going to do that. Okay? This is when I'm going to unplug and I'm going to rest. It's going to be a season, a time that I don't labor. Find it out. Talk about it. Plan it out. Be strategic. Be intentional. The next one is this. Unplug and pray unplug and pray. Have scheduled time that the phone is off and down and put away. Alright? Does this look familiar? Isn't this awesome? Some of you need a stop doing list. Go and make that list. What do I have to, what's, what's superfluous here? What's got to go? And listen, here's what happens. This is, this is, this is I'm sorry. Sometimes in order to rest, you know what people do? They trim, when they trim the fat, it's church. That's not what I'm talking about. I got to rest. I worked all week. I got to rest. That's a little bit backwards. It's a lot backwards. Okay? And the last one is this. Serve someone else. We've got the door wide open for awesome opportunities. Really good opportunities to serve this community. It's awesome. And I wrote this down for me. When we serve somebody else, it lifts our perspective above our circumstances. It took me months to write that down. Isn't that simple but true? When we serve, there's something that God does for us. Not just for other people, but for us when we 
serve somebody else. It, it changes our perspective. It changes the way we look at life. It, it, it does something to the circumstances that we face. Okay? So our, our momentum is constantly threatened. And it will take you out. And it would be years, maybe, that you start to feel that regret on the impact that you should have, could have, would have made on your children, the people at work. It's, it's hard to get that back, but God loves us so much. He says, look, look at Elijah's life. Look at how he got there. Be careful, because you can get there in a hurry. But God loves us also so much to say, hey, if you are there, if you're lonely, if you're far from me, I don't want to leave you there. I'm not giving up on you. I've got something awesome planned for you.